No bombs, no bullets. This is an invisible war. And they've developed ways to manipulate all of us. And this is all infiltration, subversion to control the narrative. To shape your opponent's perceptions of you. Our God-given rights are being silently eroded, yet we are completely unaware. Sending an official letter urging that an American elected official shouldn't exercise his right to freedom of speech. Make certain media outlets think twice about reporting certain issues or certain topics. The provost of the university personally called me out and escorted me off campus, telling me not to return. An unnoticed dark force is attacking America. Then it's a struggle between freedom and totalitarianism. The New Year's crystal ball descends at Times Square on January 1st, 2020. At the same time, over 7,000 miles away in Wuhan, China, political pressure was mounting on eight healthcare professionals. Local police found these doctors one after another around New Year's Day and accused them of spreading rumors and seriously disrupting social order. Police also warned them if they don't feel remorse, they will face legal punishment. The incriminating evidence against them? Messages they sent to friends on December 30th. One message read, seven cases of SARS were diagnosed in the Wuhan South China seafood market. Another read, one case of infectious coronavirus pneumonia was confirmed in the Haohu branch of the Wuhan Second Hospital. Others read, the government has not yet decided to make it public. Please be careful, everyone. When the Times Square crystal ball dropped, none of the revelers were aware of the political pressure thousands of miles away, but tragedy was approaching. Just hundreds of yards from the crystal ball is the billboard of Xinhua News Agency, the official news agency of the Chinese Communist Party. Seven hours after New Year's Eve, Xinhua announced on its website in Chinese, Wuhan police have taken legal measures against eight healthcare professionals because they were disseminating false information. The agency also told the Chinese public not to believe them and spread rumors. You had hero doctors that were sounding the alarm, trying to tell the world about COVID-19. And the Communist Party of China clamped down on that immediately. That censorship directly exacerbated COVID-19 and it is something that is now impacting so many Americans. Xinhua is China's official news agency, directly controlled by the State Council of the CCP. Tai Mingjiao is the president of Xinhua. He previously served as the deputy director of the CCP's propaganda department, where he ruled the media with an iron fist, firing writers who dared to tell the truth with a tight grip over the media and political loyalty to the party. Some call him the news killer. In July 2011, Xinhua signed a long-term lease for a prominent advertising space in Times Square. The fee for the giant screen is estimated at $300,000 to $400,000 per month. Don't buy! China buy! Free speech! On its first day of broadcast, a Tibetan group staged a protest saying the CCP's censorship agency is not welcome in New York City. Don't buy! China's lie! Free speech! Free speech! Don't buy! It's the official source of information that is very tightly controlled editorially by the Chinese government and Communist Party in terms of what they're able to publish to the extent that they basically use it as a way to channel the official version of events within China. The CCP calls this billboard the China Screen as a symbol of the regime's Da Weishun, or Grand External Propaganda Campaign. That multi-billion dollar media expansion plan was Beijing's response to a setback for the CCP. During the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the CCP was eager to enhance its international image by showing the world how China can host 
the perfect games. Behind the scenes, the CCP was increasingly abusing human rights and silencing dissent. After nearly two weeks of violent demonstration, Politicians and human rights groups from around the world called for a boycott of the Olympics in Beijing. Embarrassed CCP officials believed this happened because its own message was not being heard enough outside of China, so it needed a bigger voice. In 2009, the CCP launched the $6.6 billion Grand External Propaganda Campaign to fuel the global expansion of its official mouthpieces and drown out Western media voices. The CCP not only seeks to improve its image in the world, but also to further a strategic expansion of global power. As the international financial crisis began in 2008, it seemed at that time that many countries in the world were seeking help from China and regarded China as the engine out of the crisis. Therefore, the CCP was full of confidence at that time. Domestically, it felt that it was necessary to strengthen its totalitarian rule. Abroad, it also saw an opportunity to expand its power overseas and establish a communist order according to the will of the CCP. Of course, the CCP still has no way to confront the United States in military power, so it has adopted the method of information warfare. And then there's information warfare, which is a lot more subtle, which is how you shape the perceptions of your opponent. And there's a lot of different modalities um, used to achieve those, those ends, to, for one country to achieve its policy goals by manipulating another. As the vanguard outpost of this global campaign, in 2010, Xinhua rented top floor office space in Times Square to be its North American headquarters for the next 20 years. The next year, it rented the highly visible advertising screen and started playing propaganda videos. Another Chinese state mouthpiece media, China Daily, entered Americans' lives in an even more insidious way. China Daily, for example, the, the CCP controlled a state-sponsored newspaper um, uh, from China is dropped on my doorstep as a member of Congress in my house office building. That's just skimming the surface of how powerful and, and how advanced the Chinese propaganda machine really is. China Daily has been inserting a multi-page supplement called China Watch as paid advertisement into major newspapers, including The Washington Post and The Wall Street Journal over the past years. The Chinese Communist Party understands that politicians in the West, unlike there, have to be responsive to public opinion to some degree. And by growing their influence in these other media outlets, they're able to shape American perceptions of communist China to make the American public at least less hostile, which makes it easier for Chinese Communist Party officials to deal with American elected officials. Trying to shape the narrative about China, these advertisements describe the CCP as an open and civilized regime and claim that the people under the CCP's rule enjoy economic prosperity as well as freedom and that the Chinese market has many business opportunities. On the first page of the insert, in barely noticeable text, it says the content was paid for by the official media of the CCP. Don't focus on what the Chinese Communist Party, what the narrative is. Remember, a communist regime dominating a narrative and controlling the narrative, look at their actions over, over the past decade and several decades and since they've been in power. When you look at a Marxist-Leninist socialist system or socialism with Chinese characteristics, it's always for the betterment of the party. They will trample human rights, basic rights of, of individuals uh, in order to get to that goal. And they make no mistake about that. And we know what they're doing to the ethnic Uyghurs in Northwest China and Xinjiang. We know what they did uh, in Tibet, and we know what they've done to the Falun Gong and the Christians. The China Daily, sponsored by the CCP's propaganda department, was made to register as a foreign agent with the Department of Justice in 1983. New documents filed with the U.S. Department of Justice on June 1st show that over a three-year period, starting November 2016, China Daily paid over $4.6 million to the Washington Post 
and nearly six million to the Wall Street Journal. It is quite difficult for many newspapers to survive in the digital age. The Chinese Communist Party can publish a lot of information on these newspapers with such a large sum of money. People in many countries have not directly suffered from the rule of the Communist Party. They don't know how evil the CCP is. Therefore, Westerners are more likely to accept the stories told by the CCP before they are actually hurt. So, you know, Nazi Germany with uh, Joseph Goebbels. Information warfare has been with us for a long time. Now the media environment has changed. How people absorb and consume information, how rapidly, how it's disseminated, is very different from uh, early 20th century methods. But the goal is the same, and that is to shape your opponent's perceptions of you, to undermine their will to confront you. Free press in the United States has helped the world understand the true nature of the CCP in the past. In 1989, when the CCP army blood washed the Tiananmen Square democracy movement, Western reporters risked their lives and captured images of the Chinese people's fight against tyranny. In 1997, American media exposed the state-sponsored sale of human organs from executed prisoners for medical transplantation. With the free flow of information, the CCP's propaganda machine wouldn't be able to compete even if it ran at full capacity. For that reason, the CCP prepared another tool for its grand external propaganda campaign, foreign censorship. The Chinese government and Chinese officials inside China trying to obstruct foreign correspondents from covering certain stories, intimidating sources. And so it does make it harder for them to report uh, information on various aspects of what's happening in China that the Chinese government doesn't like. In 2012, after publishing investigative stories exposing CCP officials' massive wealth, both the New York Times and Bloomberg had their websites blocked in China and reporters' visas were denied. One year later, Bloomberg reportedly killed another investigative report about the financial ties of a top CCP official. In 2018, the CCP arrested the relatives of at least five reporters after these Radio Free Asia journalists covered the human rights violations in Xinjiang. In 2019, the CCP threatened data company Refinitiv, a partner of Reuters news agency, with having its service in China suspended if Refinitiv didn't remove stories related to the Tiananmen Square massacre. Refinitiv eventually complied. In addition, the CCP has expelled at least 19 foreign journalists in the past 12 months, and about 82% of foreign journalists say they've experienced interference, harassment, or violence while reporting in China in the past year. The CCP has even extended this interference overseas. Chinese diplomats are, are regularly trying to interfere with like the media space in the United States, especially Chinese language media, but not only. So it involves intimidating reporters, calling up executives to complain about particular stories, uh, intimidating advertisers who publish, who try to run ads from the local Chinese community. I think if the purpose is to try to encourage a censorship or make certain media outlets think twice about reporting certain issues or certain topics or make advertisers think twice about advertising in particular news outlets, then yeah, I would say that that's been effective in some cases. But they don't have the freedom to silence those who disagree with them or to present the Chinese Communist Party line as the only correct perspective. The censorship of speech is far-reaching and at some point can be deadly. When SARS broke out in China in 2003, the Wall Street Journal and Time magazine reported on Chinese doctor Jiang Yanyong, who exposed the CCP's official cover-up of the epidemic. The reports attracted global attention, and experts from the World Health Organization soon went to China to investigate and confirmed the CCP's cover-up, thus preventing the epidemic from spreading further. 17 years later, the CCP's censorship machine has matured. At the beginning of the virus outbreak, the CCP ordered Chinese doctors not to accept interviews from any media, and the WHO took CCP information at face value, then based recommendations on it, leading to the global spread of the epidemic. In the meantime, 
Most media in the U.S. directly quote CCP data, even after it's been exposed as propaganda and lies. Today, news outlets continue to report Chinese data as fact. China has had enormous success. Rarely mentioning how the CCP's initial cover-up left the world unprepared, costing countless lives. And instead, these media report on what lessons the rest of the world can learn from the CCP. They feel that their newspapers will have no influence if they cannot do reporting in China. So they desperately want to please the CCP and be very cautious about what they report on China and try to balance their reporting. Their so-called balanced reporting is to publish a lot of the CCP's words or simply flatter the CCP. I think this has violated the most basic principles of news journalism. Chinese government is lying about the number of deaths, and for American media to take those propaganda statements, to repeat them as fact, to deceive the American people into believing those propaganda efforts, is at its core anti-American, and from a journalistic standpoint, it's unethical for them to not do their own research into making sure that the claims they're repeating are accurate. And sadly, if you're, if you're asking what college students think and what young people, the next generation, think, Many of them simply are ignorant to the fact that this information is not truthful, it's a lie. And so shame on the media for repeating these accusations because you've got an entire generation of Americans coming up. Even as the pandemic continues to spread globally, the CCP has been trying to persuade the world not to blame China, but to praise China using its grand external propaganda machine and fake social media accounts. The CCP is pushing a narrative that the world should thank China, and it's trying to get politicians to say it. The Communist Party of China reached out to me on two occasions to pass a resolution praising them for their handling of the coronavirus. And what was probably most unusual about the request was that they provided me with the resolution. I've never had something like this happen. Roth received the two emails directly from the Chinese Consulate General in Chicago, one in late February, the other in early March. At that time, the epidemic was spreading across the United States. The American economy was hit hard as well. They actually just had the samples destroyed of the initial uh, samples taken from the, the sick uh, in Wuhan, where they had the uh, the genome sequenced and they destroyed all of that. They destroyed the evidence, they covered up, they hid, they, uh, they prevented researchers from getting into the country and they basically said, well, they see no evidence of uh, human to human um, spread of the virus. At the same time, hundreds of thousands of people were leaving Wuhan and going to all points of the compass. So all these emotions are running through me and to be honest with you, I got downright mad. And that's where I told my staff, I dictated to them a response. I said, you send this out word for word, dear Consul General, nuts. Besides anger, Roth had worries too. He realized how the CCP had extended its influence to elected officials in the United States, and that it may even be a common practice. I've never spoken to their consulate before. So that's why it makes this request very unusual and very scary that they felt that this was normal behavior for a foreign government to come to a sovereign state like Wisconsin and ask them to pass this resolution. Here's probably the part that should scare most of us. They actually felt it was okay for them to do this. So it makes you wonder, am I the first one that they've reached out to to ask for a resolution to be passed, I find it hard to believe that I would be. The New York State Senate passed a controversial resolution on June 18th, 2019, designating October 1st as the China Day. October 1st is the anniversary of the Communist Party's takeover of China in 1949. Huang Ping, the Chinese Consul General in New York, was invited to witness the adoption of the resolution. Many Chinese groups in New York State protested the resolution. Among them were groups oppressed by the CCP. They worried that the resolution would boost the CCP's image in New York State. 
A month before New York State passed the resolution, U.S.-China trade talks had collapsed because the CCP was unwilling to make real legal commitments to protecting intellectual property rights. Some federal officials called for escalating sanctions against the CCP. At that moment, the friendly gesture toward the CCP from New York State was immediately praised by the Chinese foreign minister. Since President Trump came to power, especially during the U.S.-China trade war, the two parties have reached a consensus on the CCP. So the CCP shifted its focus to state governments, because state governments don't have dedicated personnel for foreign diplomacy, and people at the state level are far less vigilant towards the CCP. Also, their understanding of the CCP's nature is not as good as people in the federal government. The CCP really wants to have some resolutions passed at the less guarded state level to create an environment conducive to itself while exerting pressure on the federal government. New York State, which was hit hard by the pandemic, has more economic and cultural exchanges with the CCP than any other state. According to the China General Chamber of Commerce, $50.9 billion of investment from China was injected into New York from 2011 to 2017, much more than any other state. The New York state government stated in 2017 that developing relations with China is one of its top priorities. The CCP has mapped out every politician in the country, down to the governors and senior elected state legislators, so it's not just national level politicians. And they've mapped out who's soft on the CCP or even likes them, who's moderate or ambivalent, and who's hostile to them. And they've developed ways to manipulate all of us. Whereas if you just want to make money and bring jobs into your state, fine, then let's cut a deal and don't ever say the name Taiwan or don't ever be critical of Xi Jinping. And we'll make sure that our party people invest businesses in businesses in your state. Is the communist regime censoring remarks of US officials? One way the regime can do this is through its sister city relationships. According to the CCP, sister cities bring more cultural and economic exchanges and cooperation. However, this cooperation sometimes comes with strings attached. When the Czech capital of Prague signed a sister city agreement with Beijing in 2016, Prague agreed to adhere to the One China policy, that is, recognizing Taiwan as part of China. This was exposed by newly elected city officials last year. The new mayor rejected including a political declaration in the agreement between the cities and wanted to remove the One China language. He said his country should not turn away from the victims of injustice. The CCP immediately threatened Prague with breaking off diplomatic relations, stopping flights, and cutting financial aid. New York City, like Prague, has signed a sister city agreement with Beijing as well. Was China's Consul General in New York sent a letter last month to the Speaker of one of your state legislatures. Here's what the letter said in part. It said, quote, as we all know, Taiwan is part of China. Avoid engaging in any official contact with Taiwan, including sending congratulatory messages to the electeds. A representative of the Chinese Communist Party in the New York City sending an official letter urging that an American elected official shouldn't exercise his right to freedom of speech. And this isn't a one-off event. It's happening all across the country. The abuse of so-called friendship goes even further. The Association for the Defense of Human Rights and Religious Freedom publicized an internal document from the CCP's Henan Provincial Party Committee, dated March 2017. The file contains the following text make full use of the foreign sister cities relationship to squeeze Falun Gong's space in their activities abroad. Falun Gong is a popular traditional Chinese spiritual practice. It's been heavily persecuted by the CCP since 1999, but is practiced freely around the world. The document from Henan province reveals something more. Since provincial party committees don't have the authority to formulate foreign policy, it means the order came from the central committee of the CCP. That means the CCP is trying to export its persecution of faith 
through its sister city relationships. The CCP has implicitly exported its values and influence to the United States. This is a kind of sharp power that forces or influences America to give up its values unknowingly. This has caused the most harm to the establishing foundation of the United States. American people have never experienced such harm in the United States history, not even during the Cold War. And this is all infiltration, subversion to, to control the narrative and to control actions throughout the United States and to weaken the United States. As of March 2019, the U.S. and China have 227 sister city relationships and 50 pairs of sister relationships between American states and Chinese provinces. The Chinese government has been methodical in the way it's analyzed our system, our very open system, one that we're deeply proud of. It's assessed our vulnerabilities and it's decided to exploit our freedoms to gain advantage over us at the federal level, the state level and the local level. Another Trojan horse entered the United States under the banner of cultural exchanges in 2004. It's part of the CCP's warfare on ideology. They are called Confucius Institutes. Beijing-funded Confucius Institutes work with American universities and schools and are billed as centers for teaching Chinese language and culture. But really, they execute a more subversive political agenda. They feed the Chinese Communist Party line on everything from, I did case studies at 12 Confucius Institutes in the United States. And when I talked to the Chinese director of one Confucius Institute at New Jersey City University, um, I asked her, what would you say if a student asked you, what is Tiananmen Square, what happened there? Uh, her answer was that she would show a picture uh, and point out the beautiful architecture. That's the most important thing about Tiananmen Square, the architecture. Um, we know that there is a major historical event uh, that happened there that students need to learn about, um, but you won't learn about that at a Confucius Institute. The CCP has opened 541 Confucius Institutes in over 100 countries around the world. About 15% of them are in the United States, the largest number in any one country. In the United States alone, the Chinese Communist Party has invested at least 158 million in Confucius Institutes, including startup and operating costs, teacher salaries, and teaching materials. The money comes from Hanban, the supervising body of the Confucius Institute, which is under the Ministry of Education of the CCP. The Chinese government reserves to itself the right to veto any course, materials, or programs. So think of this, this is a foreign government telling a college or university what it can or cannot teach on its own campus. Rochelle Peterson, policy director of the National Association of Scholars, visited 12 Confucius Institutes in the United States to conduct a case study. But none of the American universities were willing to show her their contract with Hanban. After she filed Freedom of Information Act requests, she got eight contracts and understood why the CCP wanted to keep them secret. The contract terms include, Chinese employees of Confucius Institutes, even in the United States, must obey the laws of the Chinese Communist Party. Hanban has the right to evaluate the performance of Confucius Institute teachers in the United States. American universities and employees must not tarnish the reputation of the Confucius Institute, otherwise all cooperation and funding will be terminated. The purpose is to signal to college and universities what kind of behavior is desired by the Chinese government and what kind of behavior is necessary to maintain the financial benefits of having a close relationship with China. With the Confucius Institute as the outpost, the CCP has provided various grants to American universities that host Confucius Institutes, sent thousands of Chinese students who pay full tuition and invited American university administrators to travel to China for free. When I spoke to um, American college professors who were at universities with Confucius Institutes, they felt that pressure coming down on them from their deans and from their provosts. They feel that pressure to watch what they say, uh, both because the Chinese government is listening, but also because their university is listening. 
and their university wants to maintain that, uh, that flow of money coming from China. In addition, Hanban's hiring practices have been found to include provisions that discriminate against certain faiths. This is completely contrary to American law and values. The Chinese Communist Party has wiped out the traditional Chinese culture in mainland China. Instead, it has replaced the traditional culture with the Communist Party's culture. So the cultural exchange is actually exporting the Communist Party's culture to the world. The CCP culture is contrary not only to American values, but also to the universal values of the world. If this cultural exchange is accepted unwittingly, it is actually helping the CCP undermine American values. At present, of the more than 80 Confucius Institutes in the United States, a total of 12, or nearly 15 percent, are in New York State, far exceeding any other state. When I went to Alfred University, having actually secured permission in advance to go to uh, the university and visit the Confucius Institute, I found that when I actually arrived on campus and tried to sit in a class, the provost of the university personally, personally uh, called me out and escorted me off campus. I felt deeply alarmed, um, alarmed that that basically the Confucius Institute had had set up a little piece of the Chinese government right on campus. <laughs> But keep in mind that a lot of the older generations in America, they were old enough to remember the Soviet Union. They were old enough to remember the Cold War. They remember countries crumbling under communist and socialist regimes. But a lot of young people, they don't really remember any of that. They're not super aware of what's going on there. And because of that, they're more likely to fall for the propaganda efforts than maybe older generations are. The communists and other totalitarian regimes, they try to create uh, homo sovieticus or homo communisticus in order to make people think or stop thinking and just accept what the party says is right or wrong. Beijing knows that today's kids are tomorrow's leaders. The China competition is happening. It's happening in your states and it's a competition that goes to the very basic freedoms that every one of us values. Then it's a struggle between freedom and totalitarianism, between people having uh, the choice to do with what they want with their lives and then having somebody else tell them uh, what they must do and how they must live. And that's why when I look at the, the Chinese people, you know, I see us in them. But I also know that in the end of the day, if you look at history, right always wins out. The Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, these rights bestowed to us by the Creator are being silently eroded. It's a confrontation between communism and universal values, between authoritarian totalitarianism and freedom and democracy, between atheistic materialism and God-given rights. The war of ideology is being waged on our everyday lives. Censorship and propaganda have silently broken through the line of defense of truth, and the invisible enemy, the CCP virus, has marched in without resistance. Now, we find ourselves at a crossroads, and we must decide, continue sleeping in darkness, or wake up and follow our consciences and defend our God-given rights.